Hi guys and girls, John here. In this video we're going to take a look at a boiling water reactor. We will have a quick look at the history of boiling water reactors and how they came about. We'll look at some of their design features, some of the parts and how they work. This is about our fourth Savory Nuggets video so if you like this engineering video tutorial then be sure to check out some of the links in the video description area where you can learn more about Savory Nuggets. Boiling water reactors are a type of light water reactor. They're used in nuclear power plants, also known as power stations, to generate heat. The other more common type of light water reactor is the pressurized water reactor, or PWR for short. But in this video we're going to focus only on the boiling water reactor. There are about 100 boiling water reactors in service today all across the planet. They're split into different product lines and designs such as BWR1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, 1 being the earlier design and 6 being the later design. Advanced boiling water reactors, or ABWRs, which came around in the 1990s, and then the more modern designs like the simplified boiling water reactor, or SBWR, and finally the most modern design, the economic simplified boiling water reactor, the ESBWR. About 25% of all light water reactors are actually some form or design of boiling water reactor. Typically, they'll be used within power stations for between a 600 to 1400 megawatt range. If we were looking at the entire nuclear industry and how much of the world's power is produced by nuclear energy, then nuclear power meets currently about 5% of all our requirements. But it depends a lot upon your geographical location. For example, in France, they rely heavily upon nuclear power. In the USA, although they have a larger installed nuclear megawatt capacity than France, they rely on it far less because they get energy from other sources, for example coal, gas and hydro. So before we have a look at a boiling water reactor and the components, let's have a look at how it works and why we need a boiling water reactor in the first place. So here's a nice simple diagram showing exactly how a boiling water reactor nuclear power station works. Within this grey building, the containment building, we have our boiling water reactor. It is essentially our heat source and we're going to take that heat and use a lot of other machinery in order to generate electricity. So the big question here is how can we take a nuclear fission reaction, that is to say splitting of atoms, and turn that into electricity that we can use in our homes to boil the kettle or make the washing machine run or so we can watch TV etc. Well let's keep the scientific stuff really basic. The nuclear reaction that's occurring in our boiling water reactor is creating heat. That's all we need to know. How are we going to turn this heat into electricity? We submerge our boiling water reactor in water, specifically light water. This demineralized water acts as both a coolant and a moderator. Coolant means it keeps the reactor cool and a moderator is just something we can use to control the rate of reaction within our reactor. We can increase or decrease the power out from the reactor by regulating just how much water flows through our reactor. Another way to regulate the power output is by using control rods. Control rods are slid into and out of the reactor in order to absorb neutrons and slow down the reaction or not, which speeds up the reaction. We'll look at all of these parts in a moment when we go through the boiling water reactor in more detail. So we've got our heat source. We can regulate how much heat we're generating using control rods or our moderator, which is demineralized water. Feed water is fed into the reactor and is heated up by the reactor until a percentage of it turns to steam typically about 15% of it based upon mass. The produced steam then leaves the reactor and is passed to a steam turbine. We pass the steam to a high pressure steam turbine, then a low pressure steam turbine, and then finally we'll discharge the steam as exhaust steam to a condenser, and the condenser cools the steam so that it changes state and becomes a liquid. The water that accumulates at the bottom of the condenser is not called water, it's called condensate. And once it's been reheated and treated, it's pumped back to the boiling water reactor and we classify it then as feed water because it's being fed to our boiling water reactor. 
When steam passes through the steam turbines, it causes the turbine rotor to rotate and we connect our steam turbine to a generator. The rotor within the generator rotates and we begin to generate electrical power. We then distribute this power via a electrical transformer, a substation and then into our electrical grid. Although we talk about generating power, we're not actually generating anything. It's not possible to generate energy. We're only ever transferring energy from one place to another. In our example here, we're taking the heat energy from our nuclear reaction, transferring it to our demineralized water, then to steam. Then we transfer the heat energy to the turbine so that we have mechanical energy because the turbine begins to rotate. And finally, we change that mechanical energy to electrical energy using a generator. So the entire process is simply a energy conversion process. If we could find an easier way to generate electricity without having a nuclear reactor and turbines etc, then we would already do this. If you ever look at hydropower plants, they don't require a heat source, which means they require far less equipment and machinery than a nuclear power station does or a coal fired power station etc. Now we know what the boiling water reactor is doing and why we require it to generate electricity, let's go and have a look at some of the parts and components that make the boiling water reactor work. Here is a boiling water reactor. Let's do a little spin. It's long and cylindrical in shape and it would sit normally within what's called the dry well within the containment building. You can see there are a lot of penetrations that go through the BWR. Some are quite large. This one here as an example is quite small. The green item that we're looking at is called the vessel. The item on the top is called the vessel head and the vessel head connects onto the vessel body or the vessel via studs and two nuts. We tighten up the nuts hydraulically. The top nut is a locking nut and that's there to ensure that the lower nut does not come loose over time. We've got a couple of o-rings to seal the space between the vessel head and the vessel and these two o-rings, they're actually quite thick pieces of metal, are crushed between the vessel head and the vessel. That's what allows us to create a seal. If we use our configurator we can actually take a look at the parts, vessel, vessel head and then we invert and if we take a cross section you can see how it looks on the inside. The inside of the vessel is coated or clad in stainless steel. The bits that can't be clad in stainless steel are manufactured from a nickel chromium iron based alloy which has similar properties to stainless steel and thus everything within the vessel is very corrosive resistant. If we look at the penetrations we've got steam that flows out of these penetrations at the top. We come further down, we've got feed water inlets as well as the emergency cooling inlets. Further down still, we've got some connections here and these feed to jet pumps. We'll talk about those in a moment. The jet pumps are the smaller holes and the recirculation pumps, the suction, is through this bigger hole in the center of the screen. So flow to jet pumps coming in through the small holes here suction to the recirculation pumps out through the big hole here and what you have to realize is that when we suck demineralized water out through the large hole in the middle it's coming back into the vessel through the smaller holes so it's a closed system apart from the fact that some of that water will turn to steam as it passes through the reactor at the bottom of the vessel we have these penetrations that allow our control rods to pass into and out of the vessel. As mentioned previously, we use the control rods to slow down the reaction and thus to regulate our reactor power output. Let's put the parts inside our little reactor and we'll work from the feed water inlet downwards. We've got our feed water inlet. This is our feed water sparge pipe. Feed water comes in through this connection. It flows into this sparge pipe, this circular ring with these nozzles on it. In fact, if we configure it, we can take a better look. There you go. We're spraying feed water into the middle of our BWR. 
The feed water then falls due to gravity and it's going to drip down, hits the top cover of our shroud and flows down between the shroud and the vessel. This space is called our downcomer area. As the water flows down, it actually gets taken into this item here, which is a jet pump. You can see from this angle that the water would come up here, this is our jet pump riser, and then it splits off in two different directions. And then its velocity increases as it passes through this nozzle and it flows into a mixing tube. That is this lower mixing pipe or mixing tube here. As it flows down through the nozzle, the nozzle is open and water is drawn in from the sides into this funnel where my mouse is. And then we get mixing of the feed water that is the relatively low pressure water that's been drawn into this funnel and the recirculation water, which is the water that's coming out of this nozzle. So we'll mix those two together. About a third of what passes into the mixing tube is recirculation water with the remainder being feed water. The water that's mixed comes down here and passes out of a diffuser. Let's see if I can find our jet pump diffuser. Can see it there. In fact, if we use our configurator again, we can have a better look. There we go. So you can see that the water would enter through this pipe, comes up through the riser, it splits off. That's our recirculation water that splits off, comes down through the nozzles, and is sprayed at high velocity into the mixing tube or the mixing pipe. And from the sides, then we draw in our feed water. When the feed water and the recirculation water is mixed, then we will discharge that mixed water out of our diffusers. And there's two of these per jet pump. You can see the shape of the jet pumps here. They're evenly spaced around our main reactor core. You can see the fuel assembly here. And based upon this perspective, what you have to realize is that the water is coming out through the diffusers at the bottom and is then going to turn around 180 degrees and flow upwards through our fuel assemblies. There'll be hundreds of these fuel assemblies and as the water flows, it's going to become heated. Let's go back to our cross-sectional view and we can have a look at that in a bit more detail. The water is coming out at the base of our diffusers. We've actually got this cover plate here that connects to the shroud. And that's what stops the water from flowing simply downwards. It has to flow through the jet pump, the feed water and the recirculation water. Comes out here. And then it will flow around these other items. These are the guide tubes for the control rods. And the water will flow upwards through our fuel assemblies. A fuel assembly is represented by long, thin fuel rods. And it's within this space where the fuel assemblies are that our water will be heated. You can see them here. These are our fuel assemblies. We've actually got handles on the top because we remove the vessel head in order to get to the fuel assemblies to pull them out and change them maybe every 18 to 24 months, depending upon design. Between each of the fuel assemblies, we will have control rods scattered around the top. You can see they're here. They're laid out in a pattern between the fuel assemblies so that when we insert those control rods, we can slow down the rate of reaction and thus reduce our megawatt power output. Or maybe we want to install the control rods for safety reasons. For example, to stop a runaway reaction. What's unusual about the control rods is that they're fed into the BWR from the bottom, whereas almost all other reactor designs feed the control rods in from the top and they'll fall due to gravity. The ones on this design are actually fed into the BWR using a hydraulic circuit and you can use an accumulator, which is essentially a pressure vessel, as a way in an emergency to push the control rods in 
even if you don't have any electrical power, for example when you have a blackout. Safety, as always, is a very big factor in a nuclear power plant, as it should be. So we've heated up our water, we come past these two sparge pipes here, these are for emergency cooling, we'll ignore those for the time being. Once we've passed through the fuel assemblies, we get to the top of the shroud, and the steam that's being produced is going to flow out of these tubes here, and these tubes help us to separate the water from the steam. What I've actually done now is configured the model to show you how these connect to the top of the shroud dome. And you can see that the steam would rise up through the stand pipes, through our steam separators, that's what these sections are here, and then through our steam dryers up here. So why do we have all this? We have this because the steam is quite wet. When you think of steam, you might think of it as having a white, fluffy, cloud-like appearance. You can't see steam in reality. Steam is a gas. What you're seeing when you see the steam come out of a kettle is actually moisture droplets, as to say liquid water, suspended in the steam. If you remove these water droplets, then you will not see the steam. If you remove all the water droplets, then the steam is considered dry. If you have many suspended water droplets, then the steam is considered wet. We pass the steam up through the standpipes and the steam separators to separate out this moisture that's suspended in the steam. When we do that, the dryness fraction of the steam increases because it's drier than it was before. A dryness fraction of 1 indicates that the steam is dry. Less than that indicates that the steam is wet. The way we separate out the water from the steam is by letting it flow through a series of veins that are within these pipes, and these veins in part swirl onto the steam, and the heavier liquid then condenses and begins to form on the outer periphery of these pipes. We can then drain off the liquid, but allow the gas, the steam, to continue flowing through. Even when the steam flows out of all of these standpipes, it still then has to flow through our steam dryers, and our steam dryers represent a torturous flow path. You can see they've got this grid-like pattern here. This represents quite a hard flow path for the water molecules to flow through. Gas is much lighter and less dense, so it flows through far more easily. So the steam, which is gas, will flow through, and most, almost all, of the water molecules within the steam will not. So we're separating out more moisture again from the steam, and then eventually the steam will flow out of the top. You can see the red arrows there indicating where the steam flows through the steam dryers, out of the top, into the vessel head, and then we take this steam, we'll take it out of these connections on the side here, and on the opposite side, and we'll feed that then to our high pressure turbine. And then after that, maybe to a moisture separator reheater, and then our low pressure turbine. And that is how a boiling water reactor works. If you want to learn more about nuclear engineering and nuclear power plants, then check out savory.com. We're releasing a introduction to nuclear power plants course. We'll look at things like boiler water reactors, pressure water reactors, moisture separator reheaters, once through steam generators, condensers, steam turbines, and many other parts. And aside from that, we've got courses on valves, pumps, transformers, heat exchangers, and other items related to engineering. Make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. And if you like this video, feel free to share it on social media. Tell other people about the channel, because we really do appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope to see you on another video soon. Bye for now.